I'm Terry Mancor. Uh, I'm, I'm the one person on the panel, uh, and that's because today's subject, Essentials of World Building, um, if you're not aware, there's not a lot of people who actually build worlds, and so it's difficult to get a lot of them together at once. And this was designed as to cover uh, some basic stuff for anyone who's interested in becoming a creator and becoming a writer or, or a comic artist or something like that and wants to understand how to put together a world uh, from, from bottom to top, essentially. Uh, and uh, in, in order to, to flash my street cred, why I actually have uh, uh, something to say about this, I'm the author of the Spellmonger series, uh, which is available on Kindle and uh, audiobook. Um, and there are 11 books in the series so far. I've plotted it for 30. And my goal is to make every single new volume uh, uh, a new revelation about the world that I've, I'm building. Um, I've got a reputation as a world builder, uh, according to both my fans and, and, and various critics. Uh, and uh, it, it's, it's a subtle art. Uh, I, I think uh, a lot of people think that you can just put some mountains on a map and, and be done with it. And uh, uh, there's a, a several different layers, much like uh, uh, a, a graphics program where you have different levels and layers. Uh, you need to display all of those, or at least hint at all of those, in order to build a compelling world. Um, <coughs> uh, firstly, I, 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 and, and let me give a shout out to uh, uh, everybody at the Baltimore Comic Con staff. I love this con. This is the one con that I make sure I do religiously every year. Uh, I, I find I, I have a much better idea of what's happening in and popular culture and, and just uh, in the world of entertainment alone, coming to this particular con than I do just about any other convention I go to. Uh, so, and, and, and it's a, a really well-run con, and, and I want to give a shout out to everybody who puts that together, thank you. Uh, but back to world building, uh, my world is called Calador, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm not going to make this a long commercial for, for my book series, uh, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, the, the world I want to start with is actually Middle Earth because everybody loves the world building in Middle Earth. Uh, specifically that map, if, if, if you were of the generation where you had the hardback novel and, and, and you opened it up and that big map opened up and it just mesmerized you, drew you in and, and, and made everything uh, uh, click for you. You're, you're, it, that map really is the keystone for the Lord of the Rings and for the Hobbit before it. Um, but Tolkien's map kind of sucks from a world building perspective. Uh, he has this great history uh, uh, behind it, but uh, uh, he took what I call a mythological approach to, to uh, world building. He had the gods basically come in and throw down some islands and some mountains and boom, it was done. Uh, and if you know anything about plate tectonics, geography, geology, uh, uh, hydrology, his map makes no sense whatsoever. You know, you, you can get away with that when the gods show up and boom, it's done, uh, and, and, and then it starts to fall apart. And, and with uh, the story that Tolkien was telling, that was completely uh, adequate and completely true. Um, and and, and so, so that works, but uh, the, the real key is to pick either a realistic world or a mythic world and stick with it. Uh, if, if, your, if your creators came out and established the world, um, then don't try to pretty it up with too much science later because it's just going to be ugly. If you start with a scientific world and, and, and throw a bunch of mountains or, or, or a, a giant gaping chasm in, in the place that doesn't belong there that you can't explain. Uh, and, and that's really the key. For a creator, the creator has to know everything about the world and, and a creator doesn't usually walk into the room with that whole world unfolded before them. They're exploring as they're, they're building this as, as much as anyone. Uh, and it's important to establish the reasons why your, your places are, are where they are. Uh, you might think that, that things like, like geography are not terribly important for your, your greater story. You would be wrong. Everything flows from your geography. Uh, that, that's where you live. If you're near a, a, a sea coast, then that's going to impact your the culture. If you're in the mountains, that's going to impact your culture. If you have a, a, a forest uh, uh, 
environment, then that's going to impact your culture. What your people eat, what, what gods they pray to, uh, what kind of uh, uh, trade and civilization that they have, all that flows from geography. So very first thing, figure out where the mountains and, and oceans go and why. Um, The next tier, the next layer that you have to address uh, if you want to do comprehensive world building is the biology, the flora and fauna, uh, uh, the, the woodland creatures, the sea creatures, all that. Um, and figure out how close it is to what your reader already is familiar with. Uh, if, if it's it, extremely exotic, then be able to explain that exotic nature uh, and, and maybe even make it part of the story. Ideally, it will, will be. Uh, a good world builder the, the world is part of the, uh, the, the entire uh, story. Uh, as a matter of fact, there's a, a literary term called um, uh, planetary romance uh, that, that deals with uh, uh, places like Dune, Frank Herbert's Dune, um, uh, Pern, and McCaffrey's uh, uh, Dragon Riders of Pern series. Those are great worlds that, that are essentially, the stories are the story of that world. Uh, and that's a level of world building that uh, uh, not everybody uh, undertakes, but is very appreciated by those who, who enjoy that sort of thing. Yeah. The planetary romance is, is really where, it, it's kind of like Firefly, where Serenity is, is the 10th the character on the show, uh, and, and you don't really realize that until you get to the end of the season, uh, and, and realize how important the place is to the overall story. Um, when it comes to uh, flora and fauna, hey, first of all, any questions uh, on that first section? That, that, okay, nothing, we'll keep going. Um, good world building, uh, especially in a fantasy environment, you want to uh, incorporate the elements of the, the, the world that your uh, readers or listeners live in with just enough exotic elements to make them feel that they are someplace else. And that usually comes down to details, things like, uh, and, and, and don't cheat and do the Star Trek thing where you just name it something weird in a succession of, you know, uh, blueberries, uh, uh, cranberries, and, and, and saddleberries, you know, with no one having any idea what that is. You want to explain just enough about your exotic elements to make your reader aware, but not kind of bore them or, or confuse them with too much terminology. If you call something, uh, a particular flower out, then you want to explain why that's important or at least why it's interesting. Uh, uh, yes, having a, 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 that particular yellow flower bloom in the background of your uh, uh, story is a, a great idea, but if, if it doesn't move the story forward, if there isn't some reason why that flower makes your, your characters do something or, or uh, it, unless it smells, you know, like rotting bodies or, or, or something like that. That's always another you know, sort of exotic thing that you can put in um, to uh, help flesh out your world. Uh, animals. Animals are great, but both plants and animals have to fit into some sort of ecology. Uh, you, you can't just have uh, critters sitting on the side of the mountain not consuming and not reproducing and all that. They they got to move around and, and they have to have reasons for doing what they're doing. And you, so, so not only do you have to become a planetologist uh, when, when you're building a good world, but you also have to become a biologist. And, and uh, that means picking up a lot of arcane information from a lot of different sources. Um, uh, every good world builder uh, is a, uh, a generalist first and foremost, uh, even though some like Herbert got deeply into ecology uh, McCaffrey got more into the social systems, and, and uh, but but the ecology did play a role uh, with with her work. Um, and any, any large universe, Star Wars is a, a, another good example. Uh, you, you got Jawas hanging out in the desert, living on virtually nothing. But there's enough of a hint that they have a, a, a larger uh, ecosystem behind them to give it flavor. It makes it it, it makes it uh, compelling. You know that there's a bigger world out there. And and from a writer's perspective or a creator's perspective, that's a, a lot of it. You you want to show just enough um, entertaining, new, interesting stuff, but you don't want to explain it to your reader uh, or your listener uh, and bore them to death. Exposition will, will, will get you in a hole. Just if you know it, if you know what that secret is, 
uh, if, if you know how the ecology works, you can talk about it to your reader without explaining it to your reader, if you, if you understand what I'm saying. Uh, and, and so uh, I, I encourage uh, anyone doing world building to pick those exotic elements and, and bring them to light, the, the animals, the plants, and, and how they interact with the society. Uh, make them distinctive, make them memorable, but don't give away too much. You don't need to explain every little detail. Um, remember there are predators, herbivores, and scavengers uh, in just about every ecosystem. Uh, any critter you come across needs to be one of those things. Uh, uh, whether they're domesticated, tamed, or, or wild, uh, uh, every creature is fundamentally one of the, yeah, fulfills one of those three roles. Um, with plants, uh, you, you have a lot more leeway, I guess, but uh, uh, if you want to depart from the straight up deciduous versus conifers, uh, uh, then have a good reason for that being there. You know, if you have a weird plant, like Tolkien has this great tree that sits in the middle of, of Gondor, and and the tree is the focus of, the, of an entire royalty cult that that stretches back to the the ancient ages, but it's really more or less just a tree, it, 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 and and it doesn't really have any ecological importance beyond being a symbol. Um, avoid that sort of thing unless you. you really want to double down on why the tree is so darn special. And Tolkien makes the case for it by providing the backstory. But if you're just to walk into the, you know, from, from uh, Pippin's perspective, when he first gets to Gondor uh, uh, and sees this tree, he asks the question about it and they provide the lore. Well, it's still just a tree. It doesn't do anything particularly magical except make Aragorn the king. Uh, uh, but uh, in general, it, it doesn't have an ecological purpose, and, and I discourage that in, unless you're going to make a whole story about it. Um, but, but things like crops and seasons are important. These things have to be defined for your world right at the beginning. Uh, how long is the year? How long is the day? Uh, uh, if it's more or less exactly the same as, as the earth that we live on now, then uh, uh, you can more or less just uh, skate on by with that, but any change that you make to that that standard uh, is going to mess with your your characters, your civilizations. Uh, you know, if you have a six hour day instead of a, uh, a twenty four hour day, then your 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 whole whole biology changes. Not not just uh, uh, hey, you know, we we only have to work three hours today before we, we go to bed. So um, all very important issues. Any questions on on those specifically? Yeah. Can you talk about um, explaining uh, explaining how things are by by in your story explaining how they're not? So in other words, normally they're like this, and that kind of tells something about how they're supposed to be, as well as right. That's exactly, that, that's an excellent point, and uh, uh, something that I actually do a fair amount. Um, be, being able to explain something, if you want to talk about this interesting tree or this interesting fact or, or make a, a, a plot point, talking about how it's unusual from how it usually is. That's a, a, a great writer, a literary device to be able to include essential information in without boring everybody to death. So, uh, a very good point. Um, any other questions? On? Okay. And we get down to culture, which is the fun part. This is the part that everybody likes playing around with because, you know, it's it, it it's the part where, where we interact, not just with the world, but, but with the story. Um, <coughs> the first thing to decide is whether it's human or non-human, uh, uh, and move from there. If you have human and non-human cultures move, uh, existing together, where they touch, there's going to be conflict, there's going to be story. Uh, uh, how they interact is, is, is going to be important. Are your dwarves, you know, uh, 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 evil thugs who, who want to raid everybody, or are they the uh, uh, cunning craftsmen who want to trade, and what do they eat? That's the other big question. I've always wondered, okay, dwarves live in, in mountains, what do they eat? There are no crops, they're, they're, they can't eat rocks. They either trade, uh, and, and you know they're traditionally well set up to do that, um, but they have no you know farms, so, so uh, uh, how do they exist independent, as an independent society? Um, these questions need to be asked and answered during the, the creative process. And you need to be able, when, when a fan or a reader comes up and asks you one of, a question like that, you, you don't need to scratch your head and go, I, I don't know, uh, they just live there. Um, 
human cultures versus non-human cultures. If you have a non-human culture, it's going to be non-human. You, you gotta figure out how specifically it differs from a human culture um, and, and, and what similarities are also there and, and, and be able to explain that to your uh, reader or listener in a, in a fairly comprehensive way. That includes technological level. Um, are they, you know, sitting there pounding rocks together or are they building advanced uh, machinery? Um, are they uh, uh, using artificial power sources, whether it's magic or diesel fuel, or are they using all muscle power? Uh, uh, what feudal or, or tech, uh, high tech level, uh, uh, industrial level? That, that's got to be established for virtually every culture. And then realize that within that culture, you'll have class naturally evolve, you know, uh, outside of, of fairly primitive tribal cultures that are very insular and very small. Um, anytime you get more than 50 people together, you have class evolve uh, in one way or another. Um, and so every village is going to have a, a village headman and a village idiot, uh, and, and everybody is more or less accepting of that. But figure out where, you know, this particular uh, characters came from what what if they're a smith they're not going to have a, a, a huge knowledge about anything outside of smithcraft if they're uh, a technician you know they'll they'll probably be really good at coding but not know how to build a fire uh, uh, fig, it, figure out the class figure out uh, the uh, education uh, that's available to the people in in, in your culture uh, and and be consistent with it. That's the biggest thing about world building, consistency. Uh, that's why every good uh, fantasy writer, every good, uh, in, in, anybody who's doing world building has a thick file of sketches and, and, and charts and, and stuff that where you just figure out stuff because you need to know, even if it's not something that you're going to tell your reader, you as a creator need to know that. Um, <coughs> economic necessities are always one of the very first things that you need to, to establish with your culture. Every tribe, village, and city out there needs to eat. Uh, they need to be able to trade their surplus for uh, what they don't have um, uh, uh, to get the necessities that they need. And they need industry. They need some way of being able to develop the things that they need or, or trade for. Uh, and and uh, regardless of, of where you are in history and what uh, technological level you are, those things are, are universal human essentials. So establish what they are for, for every culture that you talk about. Um, and then we get into things like uh, law and economics. And, and this is where world building gets, gets to be a lot of fun. <coughs> every human culture has law. Every human culture has economics, and every human culture has religion. I'm assuming non-human cultures do as well, uh, since we don't have very many native examples of non-human cultures. It's difficult to establish, but uh, uh, for the sake of it, let's just say that, that, that everybody has law, culture, I, I mean law, economics, and religion. Um, law, that can be best done by studying the law and the types of laws um, and that uh, we're familiar with. And, and I would encourage you to look beyond the, the traditional Western uh, European sort of law and look at, at things like um, uh, tribal values, uh, the old Brehen law from, from uh, uh, the Celtic world, uh, Hammurabi's law, Chinese law, ancient Chinese law in particular, uh, will give you some fascinating insights on how sovereign authority attempts to regulate uh, a uh, even a small village. Small villages have lots and lots of laws. Uh, if you go back into medieval England and and look at uh, uh, the few proceedings that we have left, there were levels of laws that, that depended on uh, uh, the king, the local lord, and then manor custom. And all three of those interplayed with each other. And you get some fascinating world building opportunities just arising from, from the interplay of, of those three different levels of law. Uh, economics, same thing. Um, there is no uh, advanced human culture, I mean, it, it's, uh, meaning any culture that is above slash and burn economics, uh, agriculture economics, 
uh, that doesn't have a marketplace. Uh, uh, marketplaces are a human universal as well. There's always someone with a surplus who wants to exchange it for, for something that they need with someone who has a, a, a need. Um, establishing medium of exchange, whether they use coins, paper, bits of string, what have you, or if they're, they're straight up a, a barter economy. Uh, if they have a credit system, you, most people don't think about uh, having credit in, in a uh, uh, fictional society, but uh, why wouldn't you? I mean, in order to make it realistic, people will borrow and have to re, uh, repay, and, and injustices will result from that, or, or at least uh, a, a darn good story if you, if you do it right. Um, and uh, before I jump into religion, does anybody have any questions about those aspects? Yes, sir. Um, how do you deal with the passage of time? So that when you have you know an, an industry, a thousand years later, it's not the exact same level of technology that it was. Well, that's a good question, and and uh, I would say that I would make the argument that. Um, uh, in some cases, it, it, time won't seem to pass. Uh, if, for example, there are plenty of places in uh, Central Asia where despite the rest of the world advancing in, into a much more uh, uh, industrialized society, a, a village smith is, is still there banging stuff together uh, that, that needs to be done. But the way, the way that you address the larger picture is, is by, by the way I like to do it is by picking out a historical element from uh, the passage of time and talking about how that has changed and why that has affected the character that you're, you're dealing with. Um, not not every, every culture is going to make a, a great leap forward. Not every culture is, uh, uh, and that can be for several reasons. Custom. Custom may say that the Smith has to do it this way because that's how every Smith has ever done it. Uh, 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 Indian, uh, uh, if you go back to um, uh, subcontinental India and look at the, the laws that they had uh, about uh, uh, a smith in, in, in particular, uh, I did a lot of research on smiths recently, so uh, uh, they really haven't changed uh, from this day to, since uh, uh, those laws were written. The, the smith still does things more or less the same way that they did 2,000 years ago. Um, but uh, I, I would say, yeah, pick, pick something, pick a reason why it changed and, and talk about that and, and, and invest that uh, uh, in one of your characters. Uh, it is the best one. Any other questions on that subject? Yeah. How do you balance changes that you're trying to make throughout the course of your story? Like other than sudden cataclysmic event and now everything's changed versus phasing in, like a animal changes, topology, right, right. economics? Um, well, it, Um, and so, yeah, that, that sort of thing isn't going to come up as a, a topic of conversation for your character unless they happen to be affected by it. Um, that said, uh, uh, rumors are great. Uh, I have several places in my books where my characters talk about stuff that they've heard. Now, that really drags down the action, but it really brings uh, uh, elements that I want to introduce, uh, for example, uh, uh, I, my, my books tend to be uh, uh, feudally oriented and I'm gonna do a pastiche to the Black Death because, you know, gosh, that's cool. Um, and uh, for three or four books now, I've set up the idea that there's this peasant rebellion stirring in the background. Uh, and I'll mention it every, every couple of books and, and from a, a, a couple of different perspectives so that by the time we get to that point, I've seeded the ground enough so that that when it does happen, it won't be a surprise. But but everybody it, everybody will have seen it coming. But but how it evolves will, will be why it's interesting. You it won't take you by surprise. Like oh, he just wrote in a peasant rebellion. You know, you got to lead up to it and and make it part of the background as you go. Um, anything else at this point? Yes. How would you avoid like one people becoming like a planet of I'm sorry? How would you avoid, like, all the people of one, like, race generally just becoming the same? Yeah, that, that, uh, the question is, uh, uh, how do you keep uh, every people of one race from just seeming to be the same all the time? And, and that's an excellent question. Um, I, it, 
as I point out specific characters or, or talk about specific characters, I'll talk about individual differences that they have. Um, if I'm talking about, uh, well, it, well it, in my books, it, it, it's interesting because uh, uh, different races are looking at other cultures and assuming that everybody is the same until they, they actually encounter a member of that culture and realize that, yes, uh, the uh, alcohol on have different factions the same way that the humans do, uh, different, uh, the, the same problems with uh, uh, authority and that sort of thing, uh, but they settle them differently because they're, they're, their culture is different and, and, and they have different classes and, and, and different uh, social statuses, different uh, 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 clans and, and, and that sort of thing that are all moving behind the scene. So it, it, it's kind of a good technique actually to start off and go, yes, all elves are the same. And then we meet some elves and realize, oh, there are three kindreds of, of, of uh, elves and they're slightly different. And then you meet them and, and realize that they're that each of those kindreds have like five clans and they're all in that clan over there. They're just assholes. Uh, uh, and, 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 and realize that, that uh, uh, from the very beginning that every culture that you have, you're going to have, you know, the village idiot and the village headman and, and the village shaman. And, and, and there, there are going to be extremes in every culture, and that's how I would do it. Is, is uh, you, you you point out the extreme examples in, in a culture, and and let them <coughs> kind of uh, burst on the scene for a few minutes, so that you, it, it shakes it up. Um, I'm trying to think of a good uh, uh, a good contemporary example for that. Um, and I'm blanking. Um, Wookiees. Wookiees are great. Everybody loves Wookiees because of Chewbacca. We see Chewbacca, we assume all Wookiees are like Chewbacca. For the first three movies, we only saw one Wookiee. Okay? But we assume that all Wookiees are like Chewbacca. What if Chewbacca's the asshole? Okay? And, 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 and you just kind of, uh, you, you take that sort of perspective where, where the example that you are, are presented with isn't necessarily representative, and, and, and exploring that is actually a really good narrative device, and I, I encourage you, if you're, if you're a creator, to, to think about that, you know, maybe Chewbacca is the asshole, so let's write it that way, and, and, and so when you go back, everybody hates Chewbacca, go back to Chewbacca's own world, and uh, we're, we're so glad he left. Uh, but uh, thank you for the question. Uh, anything else on that? Yep, go ahead. So uh, you mentioned that uh, anybody who's a storyteller mm -hmm. kind of has a, a filing cabinet somewhere with just oodles of information. How do you prevent yourself from expositing too much when you're going into background? Um, that's a really good question. And my wife tells me I don't. Uh, <laughs> I, I write really big books for one thing, and so I, I and, and I write for readers who like really big books, and so I I, I try to keep the exposition down to a page at most, and, and even by that time, she's screaming at me, um, and then break it up with some dialogue and, and come back to it. Uh, an iterative re uh, approach is, is a good way to do it. Um, if, it you just gotta be careful because uh, uh, you get accused of going back over the same material. Um, and, and there is a danger to that, but as long as you're bringing something, a new element into each iteration, you can you can actually make that work for you. I'd say. All right. Anything else, Ryan? Sure. Oh. Okay. Oh, go ahead. Okay. How do you handle uh, slow time to say for example, an empire and the public response to it without everyone going, "Oh no, the world is ending." That's a good question, and some people will think the world is ending, and that's okay. That that provides some some. Uh, some spice to your background. If you have a, a slow decline of an empire, you show how things aren't done quite as well as they used to be. Uh, you have old people complaining about uh, uh, how uh, uh, things just aren't as good as they are. Uh, are things aren't as good as they were, uh, and they only seem to be getting worse. Um, uh, I, I, I dare say that that just about every older person that I've met feels that way at some point or another and is, is glad to expound on that. I hope it doesn't mean our culture is in terminal decline yet. 
Um, but that's one of the ways that you reflect it is, is through, uh, through the reactions of your character. Um, everybody, I, I think, in, in our own narrative voices, we, we very much live in the present. And while we're cognizant that, that there's a past and there will be a future, we all live in the now all the time. And we don't notice, I think, except in, in cases of extreme reflection, that maybe things aren't as good as they were, or maybe things are doing better than they were. Uh, and so if you're going to call that out, um, a, a good way to do it is symbolically. Uh, 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 an old building that, that was representative of the, uh, uh, the, the old way of doing things is falling apart is a great way, or, uh, uh, and, and has become a homeless shelter or something like that, or, or a, 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 an abode of, bandit, uh, of bandits. Um, uh, Churches and temples are particularly good for this because uh, uh, unless they're state-sponsored, they're usually um, maintained by the people who believe fervently in, in that religion. And if people lose faith in their religion, then, then they stop supporting the temples in, in most cases. So if you have a, a ruined church or temple, then, then that's going to be uh, very indicative of that sort of thing. Anybody else? Okay. And we'll, we'll do a couple more questions if we have uh, time at the end. Um, magic and divinity, one of my favorite parts. Uh, I was a religious studies major at UNC, and uh, I'm one of the few religious studies majors who I think can claim to be a success without starting a cult. <laughs> so the day's still young, then, just to keep watching your emails. Um, <clears throat> But uh, I, I'm fascinated by, by religion, not, not just uh, a particular religion, but religion in general. Uh, I studied psychology of religion. Um, and uh, uh, one of the great things I, I learned in, in doing that is that all human cultures have religion. There are no human cultures that are naturally occurring uh, atheistic cultures. Um, uh, when you're looking at human universals, uh, a, a couple of things you can bank on. Religion is one. Ghost stories. It, uh, every human culture believes in a life after death and, and has ghost stories. Uh, and, and, uh, uh, but that's about it. I mean, there are not, uh, you know, unless it deals with, uh, directly with reproduction or, or, or feeding yourself, um, just about everything else uh, is, is fluid, but every human culture has religion, every human culture has, has a belief in the afterlife. So trying to write a human culture that doesn't have one of those is going to be difficult. Uh, I'm not saying it's possible. Uh, there are many philosoph uh, philosophies who have tried to engineer that artificially. They all end up breaking down for some reason. If you can write a way that works, and, and, and I, I'd, I'd love to see it. Uh, that doesn't break down, actually. Um, but it, it, let's be honest, utopias are boring as crap. Uh, so uh, uh, including religion and uh, 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 magic is uh, absolutely essential in order to make it a believable human culture. Now, when, when you talk about religion, you have to understand that there's, it, it's not just all about church. Uh, religion has levels, uh, and, and this is where, where uh, I, at least I find a, a, a lot of uh, value in, in building. Um, there's the, the personal level, how an individual feels. Uh, there's folk religion, the, the religion that kind of plays in the background of your neighborhood as you're growing up. Um, and then uh, there's a very social element uh, in most communities where there are religious gatherings, usually around a meal of some sort, uh, whether it's formalized or, or informal. The regular religious meeting and gathering is, is uh, 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 and where the social element really comes in. Um, and then you get things like uh, uh, state religion. Uh, we, we don't have much experience with that here, but uh, there are plenty of um, uh, cultures where state religion mandates, uh, Confucianism is, a, is an excellent example. Uh, you don't see a lot of uh, uh, Confucian missionaries out there trying to convert you to Confucianism. But uh, in traditional China, Confucianism was the religion that standardized everything. It was the state religion, the regulatory board, and everything. So uh, very important element. Um, that you can import or import and change around. Um, and then there's the cosmic sense of religion, you know, the whole existential, why are we here, why are the elder gods here and want to kill us, uh, that sort of thing. Um, you know, uh, those cosmic issues usually are affected by 
what religious studies people call phenomenology. Um, it's uh, why we tend to uh, uh, make religious things like the moon in the sky, because we've got a moon and it, it, it waxes and wanes and it crescents. The moon ends up showing up in just about every religion as a sacred symbol. Um, uh, even Islam, uh, uh, which has incorporated what was originally a goddess symbol as, as its main emblem. Um, the moon is visible from every point on the earth, and, and so that bit of phenomena shows up in the cosmic religion. Uh, if it wasn't for the moon, and, and, and this is one of those areas where, where being a generalist is very important uh, when you're building the world. Um, a friend of mine came to me, had a great world, but it didn't have a moon. I said, okay, if you don't have a moon, you can't have tides. You uh, uh, have no, you know, variation in your night sky beyond, you know, where the little planet. And he's like, we, I wanted to do one without a moon. But you can't do all this other stuff then. You take out the moon. You, you just can't. Unless you put something else up there that's just as good as a moon to fulfill that place. Um, so phenomenology plays into the cosmic level, but the cosmic level is not an area where your characters are really going to be very aware or, or necessarily uh, uh, dwelling on it unless they happen to be one of the forces of the cosmic world that are, are playing out in your story. Um, and, but keeping all of those uh, elements of religion in mind as you're describing a human society is very important uh, because even if you specifically are not religious, the society that in which you reside is, and regardless of, of, of uh, uh, what kind of character you are. Um, now for the other bit of fun stuff, uh, the details. Uh, the devil is in the details, God is in the details, uh, it, it, it's all in the details. If you want good world building, you bring that world into uh, your reader's sphere in a way that they can identify with. Great scene in The Hobbit, uh, where they're having the, the party at the very beginning. Um, that does more to world build than the map does. Uh, it, it tells you so much about both the character and the world in which the character lives in because it essentially describes a, a meal, a party, uh, not a battle or anything like that. It, 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 it's, it's pretty common, but you pick up the fact that Bilbo you know, has a, a keg of ale in the back that helps establish a social uh, social place and and uh, 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 his his preparedness level of preparedness I guess and establishes the fact that the Shire can produce an advance enough economy to to be able to uh, uh, have a grocer for example um, that that whole first chapter of uh, uh, the Hobbit builds the world of the Shire before yanking Bilbo out of it and and letting you see it from his perspective after giving you a place that's safely rooted, uh, it draws him and you through the story till you're so far away that that you understand essentially every step on the road and, and remember what where you came from at the beginning. Um, and it, 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 one of the few things I thought the Hobbit movies did really well was have Bilbo reflect back on how much he wanted to get back to the Shire and and the uh, uh, how that. Uh, uh, kind of fed his personal uh, narrative throughout the books. But uh, uh, things like what you eat and drink on a regular basis. Uh, uh, we're a burger and fries sort of, of, of society, so you know, uh, someone describing us would, would have to put burgers and fries in and, and you would uh, uh, make a lot of uh, uh, assumptions about the, the world based on that and your experience of that. If you put in something really, really weird and, and, and uh, for example, how do you describe a new flavor without cultural context? Uh, uh, I, uh, my world is technically a far future human colony that decivilized, but there are all these exotic alien elements in it. How do you describe something that's like cinnamon but not cinnamon? Uh, how do you, it, without, without talking about cinnamon? Uh, it, it's difficult to incorporate those sorts of things. So you take things that you know your reader is already familiar with and, 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 and you say it's kind of like that, but then it's a, a little like this over here too. Those are the sorts of exotic, um, I guess, staples that, that you can pull in and, and give to your reader to help build the world around them. Uh, uh, especially smells. Smells are great. Um, you want to build a world, make it stink. 
uh, uh, seriously. Uh, the identification that the reader or listener has with your world, uh, uh, if you bring in the sense of smell, smell evokes memory more powerfully than any other uh, uh, stimulus. So by incorporating those things, that, you know, the smell of mold, the smell of a decomposing body, the smell of bread baking or, 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 or uh, uh, cheese fermenting, uh, uh, all of that uh, adds tremendously to um, kind of an immersion. And, and of course, following that sounds, uh, uh, temperature, that sort of thing, as you're describing your, your character's immediate world. Um, but smells particularly stick in your mind. Uh, just a couple of uh, uh, social customs, marriage and family. Every human society has those too. And how they are presented are a major part of every human culture. Um, if you want to describe good world building, you need to know how people you know, get together and reproduce uh, and uh, 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 whether or not you know, they, they kill each other or have divorces or, or, or have uh, uh, legal separations and, and all that. What happens to uh, children if their parents are orphaned? Uh, uh, lots of little questions that you, you, you don't really think of when you're, you're describing your gutsy fantasy hero slaying a dragon, but, but uh, they're absolutely essential details for, for make, building a world that, that uh, your readers find both believable and interesting enough to live in. Um, and, and as far as social custom, what do you call each other? Yeah, this is, this is a, a great uh, uh, point for uh, especially in someone who's just starting world building. Start with, are you, you know, the pronoun issues. What, what title do I use? Uh, uh, is someone who is in a lower social status obligated to treat someone in a higher social status deferentially verbally, in a verbal manner, or, or is everybody in a fairly egalitarian situation? Uh, surprisingly, um, Things like uh, feudal villages, there's actually a high degree of formality involved uh, in everything that's done because the, those formal, uh, those formalities keep uh, larger social issues from rubbing together and causing peasant revolts and things like that, even if it, it, it might seem a little um, derogatory from, from an exterior perspective. The fact that there is a manor lord and there, that manor lord keeps things running and we're deferential to that manor lord. You know, sure, it has to do with the fact that, that you owe him rent, but it also has to do with the fact that without that respect, then he can't do his job. And, and so figuring that out up front is a, a good way to start uh, with uh, uh, building, building the world. Um, that's uh, the, the basis of what I have. Do I, do I have questions? Anyone? Yes, sir. Where in your creative process do you schedule world building before I advance my storyline or my outline and I'll spend the next six weeks uh, you know. um, I would like to say yes uh, but it, it unfortunately inspiration doesn't always work that way um, and so what usually happens is I'll be minding my own business just writing writing along and come across a question uh, that I have to answer before I can move forward another word and then I will spend sometimes three or four days absolutely obsessing about it, uh, doing deep dive research on it until I either figure it out uh, or come to the conclusion that it doesn't matter. And, and, and believe it or not, coming to the conclusion that it doesn't matter can be a very important decision to make and doesn't mean that the entire process is wasted. You, you, you never waste your research. You, if you go to the trouble of truly researching <coughs> something, you will find a way to include it in the next, uh, uh, in, in some future work. Anybody else? Yep. Yes, sir. Yeah, um, the religious aspect. Uh, could it be problematic if, let's say, you, you write uh, about the religion kind of in passing, right? But later on in the book, you radically change religion. Like, I don't know, let's say that the, the God that you're worshiping is actually a false God and a lot of the belief system and everything, and even the God itself is something far older and radically different than what was proposed before. <laughs> well, um, we have had ample uh, historical uh, representations of what happens when, when that sort of thing happens, when you have changes in religion and, and, and culture. Um, 
on, honestly, it's difficult. Uh, uh, I, I would say look to history and see what, what's come before. Uh, uh, there, there are some great uh, missionary accounts of, of that sort of thing happening uh, across time. Uh, and, and by reading, when, when there's a shift in religious culture, uh, for example, where, where Islam uh, and, and Christianity and Judaism, the Buddhism, all sent missionaries out into the world and changed entire cultures from uh, at a fundamental level. Um, uh, from our perspective, you know that that's a line in a history book. From the perspective of the people who were there, there were riots and there were fights and families and, and that sort of thing. Uh, uh, if if you're addressing it socially, now if you're addressing it on a cosmic level, then you have a lot more freedom and your character can can express themselves and, and, and their relation to divinity. Uh, a lot more succinctly, I, I would say, than, than approaching it from a social level. But both are important, I would say, for, for uh, pushing a narrative that deals with religion. The, the hard thing is, they get this, um, the hard thing from my perspective, how do you write in a God's voice? You know, what do gods think about, and how do they think differently from from other other creatures, other entities and beings? Uh, and and Answering that question will help figure out, you know, you know how your entire divine system works. Uh, but uh, from a writer's perspective, it really sucks because I don't know how divinity. It, the closest I get is radical uh, uh, egomania, and, and I've got that already. I know how that works. I, it, it, but, but how do you add actual divine power to that and, and divine responsibilities and, and make that work? That's a, a, a tough thing to handle. Yes, sir. Uh, when it comes to the, I guess, the contract between the world builder mm -hmm. and the reader, mm -hmm. how do you feel about um, stories where it turns out that the characters that have been giving world building were wrong? Like, they either, let's say, like a hobbit where they didn't know? Or right, right. Maybe well, it, it, that's actually a, a good point. I, I think that you can, um, uh, you can actually get some, some, some mileage out of that. That hey oh yeah I, I I trained you from youth to be a uh, warrior who goes out and kills the evil dark lord, but I was just fooling. There's no evil dark lord, uh, uh, and and that would be a great story. It really would, you know. Uh, and, and I I think that's how you handle it is you you make those sorts of mistakes part of the narrative and and give a darn good reason. I mean that that's where story comes from. I, I get it. Establishing a character, screwing them up, and then giving them a darn good reason for, for unscrewing themselves, essentially. How are we doing on time? Hey, just curious. 14 minutes. Oh, okay. Good, good, good. Yeah, go ahead. So, uh, while there's no, no such thing as wasting world building, mm -hmm. how do you prevent yourself from getting lost in the filing cabinet? And uh, getting lost in the filing cabinet. I write a lot of short stories on the side, um, and the reason I do that is is not everything. It, more happened in the Civil War than Red Butler song, uh, is how I put it. Um, basically, there's in any world you have to imagine that there's going to be a lot of people, a lot of perspectives, and and uh, the way from from getting yourself caught up in and and that kind of uh, trap is, is by exploring those, in my opinion. I mean, other writers have, have uh, might tackle it differently, but uh, from my perspective, uh, uh, I, I spun off, for example, uh, a young adult series because uh, medieval life was brutal and nasty and ugly, but there were teenagers who lived through it and they did stuff, uh, and, and they became, you know, adults. Um, so I, I told essentially the same story that my readers were familiar with, but from an apprentice's perspective but included the time from before when she was a, an apprentice and introduced her world before that. And, and that whole addition of perspective, I, I think really, it, it not only expands your ability to world build, uh, because now you know not just you know, why the mountains are there and, and, and why the ocean is there, but you know why her particular little village is there and what they think and what they believe and how it really doesn't have much to do with anything outside of their borders. Um, and, and, and shifting those perspectives, I think, adds to the narrative and, and, and does a huge amount for world building. If you have just one little narrative voice all the way through, it's very difficult to give a, 
the idea of a larger world around it. Questions? Yes, sir. And you said magic and religion is sort of your favorite area. Is there uh, a kind of area that you think you've had difficulty with or something you'd like to improve at? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, brevity, for one thing. I write really, really long books. Uh, uh, but no, um, I'm getting better at character, uh, to be honest. I, basically, it, fantasy writing is a, a, a mixture of character, plot, and world building. Um, and, and you have to have magic, by definition, in order to, to make all that work uh, as a fantasy. Uh, as, as someone showed me recently a, a fantasy that didn't have any magic in it. And I'm like, well, it's, it, you got swords and stuff, but you got no magic. If you have no magic and no rules for magic, you've got no fantasy. So, but taking the magic aside and, and looking at uh, all those other elements, um, I would say my plotting works only because I'm doing such a really long work that if I screw something out, up, I have like another 19 books to fix it at this point. Um, and, and I can make y'all think that I'm meant to do that. And, and a lot of writing is, is just that, especially series writing, uh, where you see continuity. And, and the comic book convention is the perfect place to, to bring this up. Continuity is, is you, you've got to be consistent and all that, but, but uh, uh, it, it, it kills you when, when three readers point out that, that in the new book, this great scene with this character can't happen because you've already established that character wasn't there for that scene. And now I've got to write another book to explain it. Uh, and that's just, can be a little daunting. Um, character is probably my weakest, but because of that, I've spent a lot of time focusing on it. Uh, Orson Scott Card actually, in my opinion, wrote the best book about character, uh, uh, especially, it, and he's a, a sci-fi writer, a sci-fi fantasy writer, uh, but just in terms of, of the best approach for a writer to take towards character uh, is in that book. Um, uh, and, and, and world building, man, that, that, that's, that's just me being a nerd. I mean, let's, let's be honest. We all love world building because it gives us minutia to wrap our <coughs> and, and, and gives us points where we can project ourselves into that universe. Uh, and ultimately, for a writer, that's, it, it, unless you're deeply into dystopias, that's really what, what you want to produce is, is that sort of thing. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Uh, can, uh, if you don't do it extensively, and you, uh, you supply footnotes and maybe like a uh, appendice or something at the end to expound a little bit more on certain ideas, can that help? Yes, it can. And, and, and what happens if you're if you're doing a large work, and just ask George R. R. Martin about this, uh, if you're doing a really large work, your, your fans are going to demand it, um, uh, which is why instead of finishing the next book in the series, he went back and and essentially published his, his series Bible. And, and uh, I forget the name of the book, Fire and Ice or something like that, was the most recent one that he released. It's all the backstory stuff. Um, and and uh, uh, that's very helpful uh, as a writer. But yes, your fans will demand it. And it and makes you go off and, and, and do these other. It, the problem is no one really wants to do an appendices, uh, appendices like Tolkien, because that's just too derivative of Tolkien. If you're not Tolkien, you can't really pull that off. Um, it, you can throw a glossary in the back sometimes. Uh, uh, or you can have a minor character uh, uh, add that um, uh, for perspective. Uh, I, I really discourage footnotes just because they're distracting and they don't translate well to audiobook. Uh, <laughs> um, which is a, a consideration for, for writers these days. Uh, uh, that being uh, such a big market. Um, but uh, yeah, it, 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 it can be difficult. Other questions? Yes, sir. How do you make a determination about how potent magic is? Low level magic versus universe shaking magic that build rules so that it's consistent every single time? That's a really good question. And, and that's probably the hardest thing for a fantasy writer to do. Um, uh, you, you have to start with the, it, it's like physics. It, it basically, you come up with magical rules the same way you would come up with rules to describe a, a physical problem. Um, but because it's magic, you have to define first what magic is uh, and, and what, what it, you know, if you ask someone what is magic, 
they're going to have a difficult time explaining technically what magic is. From, from my perspective, I started with the idea that magic is, is conscious intent to change, to successfully change the rest of the universe, um, which is a really broad definition and immediately lends itself to being interpreted in all sorts of ways, which is why I never state that explicitly in my books or, or my fans will sit there and argue over you know, well, are you being intentional or you're not being intentional? Um, I think that establishing the rules of that mag of the magic uh, in the system will set will automatically recommend uh, how you handle it and how powerful it is. Tolkien's magic was very powerful, but very sparingly used. Uh, the only times you saw Gandalf and and uh, uh, the elves really break bad with magic was when things were really dire. Uh, there were Nazgul on the horizon, and, and, and it was absolutely needed. In my world, magic is a profession, is, is a, a trade that you, you pick up um, if you're talented enough. It, it's kind of like having perfect pitch. Uh, being born with perfect pitch, you, you, you might be a singer someday. Uh, if you're born with magical talent, you're probably going to be a, a wizard of some sort, uh, depending on how that talent is, is expressed. That was the fundamental rule that, that I picked, and, and then all the other ones kind of fell from that. But even behind who gets to perform magic, you have to, before you even get there, have to figure out the, the nuts and bolts of how it's going to work in your, in your world. And that's really, really difficult. Uh, because every time you make a rule, you immediately think of, of 30 exceptions to that rule. Uh, and unless you want to uh, write a story about each of those exceptions, uh, you better tighten that rule up somehow. But uh, uh, yeah, it, it, I would say establish the rules of magic first and foremost in any fantasy. That's, that's, that's key. Other questions? That, that's, that's another really good question, uh, uh, if you didn't hear it. If you're in a rut as a writer, how do you get out of that rut? Um, I, I write on a daily basis, uh, uh, at least four or five hours a day, and if I find myself lacking inspiration, um, I try to change my intellectual environment a little bit and, and throw something... Uh, 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 most recently, it's been uh, MGM musicals and dance numbers for no particular reason. It could be, you know, war movies or, or cowboy stuff or, or something like that. I try to get out of my head and allow the, the rest of the universe to throw suggestions at me. And uh, eventually I'll, I'll go, oh, that's what I was missing. Uh, and, and incorporate that into what I'm writing. And I, I encourage you, if you're, if you're a creator, you definitely want to develop good discipline for how you approach your craft, but at the very same time, you always want to leave yourself open to these, these other influences that may have absolutely nothing to do with your, what you're writing or how you're writing it, but can inform you in ways you don't even understand at the time. Um, and and I, I can't really explain it any more specifically than that, but, but uh, uh, even when I'm in, you know, writing 14 hours a day and trying to finish up a book and, and, and all that, uh, uh, I, I will force myself to get out and, and do something that is absolutely unrelated with uh, what I'm writing about in order to keep it fresh, honestly. Because, yeah, yeah it's, you, you have an, another invading goblin army that gets stale after a while and you, you want to put in a, a jaunty dance number or something. How are we in time? Three minutes. Three minutes. We got three minutes for a question. Yes, sir. An excellent question. Uh, I would say either by focus or exception, meaning that depending if if your theme is a, a, a coming of age story, uh, or your give me a theme to work with, and, and I'll give you an example. Development of communication between people, that's a, a, an excellent one. Um, I would make the focus of the story, I, I, again, either focus on it or 
talk about it to its exclusion. If, if you're talking about two different peoples and, and, and the establishment of communication with them, um, talk about one one group of people first, then talk about the other group of people, and and talk about what happens when communication doesn't happen. Um, talk about the problems that arise from it. Uh, if because otherwise you're, it, it, I actually think that's a more interesting approach than, than talking about how successful communication happens unless that successful communication came as the result of, of something particularly interesting. Uh, uh, so that, that, that's an intriguing thing. Uh, 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 Piper actually did an excellent story about that very thing. H. Beam Piper, a golden age science fiction writer, wrote a short story um, I think called Rosetta Stone, where the communication wasn't between um, uh, two living groups of people, but it was humanity trying to understand the communication of a dead Martian civilization. Uh, so it, so you're, you're basically walking into an alien civilization and seeing just the ruins and trying to figure out how do you communicate with them enough to, to you know, it, it's sort of like the question that we have with Mesoamerican hieroglyphics. We don't have uh, enough context to be able to, to figure it out. Piper's way of, of, of uh, uh, hitting this theme was um, he had a scientist realize that one of the things that they were looking at, one of the big hieroglyphs that they were looking at, left over from the Martian civilization, uh, could only be the periodic table because that's something that's going to be expressed in any advanced culture uh, more or less the same way by its nature. Uh, the relationship between the, the elements is going to be fixed because their physical properties and describing them is going to occur in a particular pattern, <coughs> even if it, if it doesn't look like the periodic chart that we're familiar with, um, those same elements are going to be organized in those, those categories and groups. And from that, they were able to extrapolate what everything else meant. So, uh, which I thought was a brilliant uh, uh, way of focusing on the problem of communication through a means that, that what didn't actually involve communication. So that's how I would approach it sideways. All right, it, it looks like we're out of time, but I hope you enjoyed this. And uh, I will be, I will be at uh, KigaCon, I believe it, it, it's called, in uh, March, uh, where uh, I'm hoping to do a panel on intermediate world building. This is kind of the basic stuff, uh, uh, mountains and valleys. Uh, but the, we'll, we'll talk about, uh, at, my, at my next little panel, what, uh, how to develop the world a little bit. Thank you so much for coming. I